Election Day in America, and it is an off-cycle year. Thank God. Concrete action starting to come out of the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow. And if a good show airs on cable and no one's there to watch it, does it actually make a sound? Tuesday Need to Know. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for November 2nd. I'm Carlo Bersano, and I'm here... That's right. Baker yes. Machado, he's in today for Jill. Baker, great to see you, man. How you doing? Carlo, always good to see you as always, my friend. Happy Tuesday. Hash, happy National Deviled Egg Day to you. Uh, I know this is a, dear, <laughs> a day near and dear to your heart. For most of us, it, uh, we vomit on, a, on an idea of, uh, I, of uh, any deviled eggs. I mean, I don't particularly like the idea of eating deviled eggs at 6 in the morning, but I, do, <laughs> I like a good deviled egg. I like a good yes. deviled egg. Yes, yeah. if you're drunk on Thanksgiving, deviled eggs are absolutely delicious. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Carla, we have so much news to get to. It is insane, so let's dive straight into it. And did you know, by the way, uh, today's an election day. Today is it actually is. a day people go to the polls and vote uh, in several high-profile contests, chief among them the Virginia gubernatorials race. Uh, now, pundits closely watching that contest as a sort of proxy for the Biden administration. Democrat Terry McAuliffe has been running ahead of Republican Glenn Youngkin, though the latest polls have them either tied or Youngkin slightly ahead. Now, Terry McAuliffe has been trying to tie Youngkin to President Trump, though the two not particularly close. But that said, President Trump did hold a teller rally urging his Virginia voters to turn out for the Republican. But we should note uh, Glenn Youngkin nowhere to be found <laughs> at that rally yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, he's definitely uh, trying to keep Trump um, at an arm's length distance, just given that Virginia is now really a, not even a purple state. It's really a blue state at this point. And it, it has been. I don't think won any, by 10 percentage points in 2020. I don't think any uh, Republican has won a statewide election in Virginia since 2009. So that could change today. That race. Yeah, Bob McDonald. Yeah, all about uh, education in Virginia, which is interesting. That's not something that we've seen as really the uh, motivating factor in a, in many statewide elections recently. That is a potential warning sign, I think, for Democrats ahead of the midterms. Um, but just uh, all the in other races around the country here, the GOP also hoping for an upset in the New Jersey governor's race. That's very unlikely, but that yes, would be a huge yes. deal. Yeah, yeah. The polls happened. are polls are really far ahead there for Murphy, but it's closer than his last race. So you're right. Yeah, uh, here in New York City, we're technically choosing our next mayor, though, spoiler alert, it's going to be the Democrat, Eric Adams. He's up by 30 in the polls in that race, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think he's got that one in the bag. Boston is electing its first woman and first person of color as mayor, regardless of who wins in that race. That's an interesting one to watch. And up uh, upstate in Buffalo, New York, there's a uh, real another interesting mayor race between an avowed socialist and the incumbent Democrat who's actually running to keep his seat as a write-in candidate. Uh, that race is going to provide a sort of test of the strength of the progressive wing of the party this, uh, this year. As for v Virginia, though, which, of course, is the big one, Let's do some predictions. I mean, I think McAuliffe Ooh. is going down. I really do. You think do. Karen I think McAuliffe that... is going to lose here? So, I do. Uh, so off-year elections are usually really hard for the incumbent party. One, because you have yeah. to really sort of motivate your base, and you're going up against – you know, an opposition party who is incredibly motivated right now, Republicans incredibly motivated right now to go to the polls based on, you know, how much of the of, uh, they do not like the Biden administration right now. Um, on top of all of that, as I mentioned, Joe Biden won Virginia by 10 percentage points. But literally, this is a coin flip at this particular point, And it's because Glenn Youngkin has been able to use critical race theory, schools, yep. the coronavirus, in many ways to his advantage of disenfranchised and upset parents over what's been going on in terms of schools, to his advantage. And this is why Terry McAuliffe has been trying to use Trump as his way to galvanize Democrats to get to the polls. This gives us an indication about how both parties are going to use those respective ideas to motivate their bases yep. for the midterms next year. Republicans think they might have a winning issue here when it comes to schools and critical race theory, you know, something you see in conservative media ad nauseum every five minutes or so. And look, Democrats still believe that Trump is enough to motivate their voters to get to the polls, even though Trump is not on the ballot, yep. per se. I That's the big question. Uh, uh, but uh, if we're making predictions here, I, uh, I'm, you, look, I'm terrible at predictions, but if I had to guess, I think Glenn Youngkin does surprise here, but I bet you it's within one single percentage yeah. point here. I bet if it, anything, we might even go to a recount. It might be that close, Carlo. 
yeah, we probably won't even know tonight if it's going to be that close. But just to your point about um, how he Youngkin has m- been able to mobilize, uh, you know, parents and suburban voters. I don't know if you saw some of these pictures out of his rally the other day in Alexandria, Virginia. That's the D.C. suburbs. That's about as blue as it gets. Oh yeah, true. He had an inc- he had an incredible turnout there. Yep. That w- if you're a Democrat and you saw those pictures, that was giving well, you and some. And suburbs uh, are huge because yeah. those suburban voters are the ones that came out and turned out for Joe Biden in 2020. Exactly. Independent suburban voters who traditionally vote Republican, but we're really upset with President Trump, you know, because Glenn Youngkin is trying to sort of, he's trying to ride the coattails of the Trump base, but not really like become a Trump candidate. And this is where yeah. Republicans think they might have an advantage here by sort of uh, tiptoeing their way around Trump without alienating his yeah. base at the same time. Um, let's talk about President Biden here. He vowed that the U.S. would lead by example when it comes to climate change, but the president stopped short of announcing any concrete new pledges on the very first day of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Now, today, Carlo is expected to bring more uh, specifics. More than 100 world leaders are about to announce a deal that would reverse deforestation by 2030, with Brazil actually one of the big key signatories on that pledge, which we should note is non-binding. President Biden also planning to announce major new regulations when it comes to methane, the greenhouse gas that's far more potent than CO2. That announcement would restore and strengthen regulations that were canceled by the Trump administration, Carlo. So I see that everybody has moved into their respective corners uh, as usual whenever climate becomes a big news story. So uh, on the right, you've got conservatives ripping, uh, you know, politicians and the elite for being hypocrites and taking, you know, their private jets to this uh, oh, yeah, yeah. climate Not masking, summit. All that. I've seen that everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, like it's ridiculous. Bezos is like, on, you know, going from his yacht to helicopter to private jet to, to go space. to a climate summit. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> so that is ridiculous. I get it. Um, but on the other end, you've got uh, you've got libs. You've got the left sort of going, you know, alarmist talking about how this is our last best hope at keeping human civilization alive. There's truth to both of those. Right. But neither is helpful. So I just want to I want to sort of like decatastrophize the climate issue. And in therapy, you learn about decatastrophizing oh, things. Yes. Right? I hear about it to... all the time in my therapy classes. Yeah. So t- <laughs> your therapy classes. <laughs> Sorry, that, that, that cracked me up. Um, so, yeah, let's let's just do a little like level setting on climate here. And I am a huge climate alarmist, as you know, but it's just not helpful to talk about how, like, if we don't come out with a deal at this summit, you know, we're all going to be underwater in 20 years. So just remember our the need to know guiding principles when it comes to climate change. Number one, this is the big one. Anything that emits carbon dioxide needs to be replaced by something that doesn't emit carbon dioxide. We have the technical capability to do that right this second. We just we don't do. have the will. Number two, nothing, and I know this is going to hurt, you know, hurt a lot of people's feelings, but it's true. Nothing you personally do to prevent climate change is going to matter at all in the scheme of things. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, right? You should recycle You should try and limit your emissions where possible. You should be cognizant of your carbon footprint. But it doesn't actually matter, right? The outcome of of all of this is going to be that either large-scale actors, whether that be you know, countries, nation states or companies will succeed. And we're going to get by by the skin of our teeth with the sort of life of extreme weather events and some serious but livable disruptions or those large scale actors, companies and governments will fail, in which case we're all screwed. Number three, which ties into number two. As soon as the price of of climate change is seen as more economically important than the price of preventing climate change, the financial cost of the problem is no longer going to matter. This this does not really. A lot of people don't really seem to, you know, understand this. That is coming sooner than anybody thought. We're starting to see that now. So that's going to be a very painful economic disruption, and that's going to be very, you know, a difficult thing to get through. But the end result is going to be there's going to be more progress because. It's going to we're going to get to a place where the money doesn't matter. Right. We have to spend what we have to spend to decarbonize the atmosphere. So, again, those are our sort of guiding principles. Keep those in mind whenever you hear everybody starting to, you know, uh, get into the the nitty gritty about, you know, somebody taking a private jet or a motorcade to a climate conference. You bring up a lot of really Interesting, and I think very valid arguments there, Carlo. You know, with this COP26 summit, we have all these global leaders 
some good things coming out. For instance, this morning I saw a report that all of the Western nations basically helping countries, smaller, more poorer countries like even South Africa, get off of coal and helping them with their renewable energy. That helps tremendously because you this is a global situation here. Yep. That you have to even get the poor countries that don't have the technological infrastructure to play ball here. Uh, the problem is, is with things like this, when China in particular, 25% of the emissions going out into the atmosphere when it comes to carbon come from China. And China has yep. to come and play ball here. So far, they have not had any interest in playing ball. So to your earlier point, you can do all the things that you want and your country can do all the things that you want to try to help when it comes to the climate issue. But if you have countries that are polluting 25% out there, that are doing nothing about it and have no interest in doing anything about it, that becomes a very huge problem here. The, the thing that makes me optimistic here as somebody that cares deeply about our climate is businesses are starting now to realize yeah. the financial incentive for them now to start adapting to uh, more renewable energy sources, you know, all that other sort of stuff. Because once they once it hits their pocketbooks, they realize that it's a better alternative to switch to these greener sort of things out there from wind power to everything else. But right now for so many companies, coal and natural gas and all these other things are so cheap for them right now that this is why you continue to see, you know, those still being used as a form of energy right now. Right. Well, one last thing I'll say on this, uh, just I want to plug something. Cheddar has a big climate special today oh, yes, tied to the COP26 uh, COP summit. That is on 2 p.m. That is on at 2 p.m. Eastern today, wherever you watch Cheddar. I will be on for some reason. I am uh, part of the show. <laughs> yes, you are. I love this. And I'm, uh, I'm going to be doing a segment on some of the EPO. Uh, I can't really speak this morning. What's wrong with me? It's a Tuesday. Uh, some it's of the, fine. Yeah, I know. Uh, some of the eco uh, hypocriticism that we're talking about here. I'm doing a segment on the, what the Royals can offer Ooh, at COP26. Yes. But I'll give you a little hint. I'll give you a little hint. Not much. Not much. <laughs> but they're trying. They're trying. Uh, any, anytime we get you on television, more Carlo. I love it. And anytime we get you on television talking about the Royals, I really love it. Let's talk about the coronavirus, Carlo. Countries like the U.S. slowly but surely learning to live with the pandemic as it morphs into an endemic virus. China, now one of the few countries going hard on a zero COVID eradication policy. And by the way, it's proving hard to manage. The difficulties of that stringent approach were put into stark relief when the government locked down Shanghai Disneyland over the weekend when a single guest was found to be COVID positive. Now more than 30,000 visitors to the theme park were locked in Inside and they were unable to leave until they each uh, drew a negative test. Carla, this was the visuals of what was happening in <laughs> Shanghai Disneyland. Crazy. As somebody who loves Disney, I would love to be trapped inside of Disneyland, but the idea that you're yeah. trapped inside of Disneyland with potentially people that are testing positive for COVID now turns into my worst nightmare. It's sort of like Squid Game uh, vibes, yes, right? It's true, like, with Mickey know, Mouse. Yeah, uh, you'll all be, uh, you know, Teams of two. I'm going to repeat the instructions here. Um, but no, the video on social media is showing this sort of surreal scene of guests at Shanghai Disneyland lining up to get tested, uh, you know, from people in full PPE as like the fireworks were going off in the background, lighting up the Disney castle. Very odd. But, you know, this is interesting, right? Australia has been in and out of lockdowns now for 18 months. It, these kind of like zero COVID policies, it, they're just not workable solutions to this. No matter where, no matter what kind of government you live under, you just, it's not going to work. And people need to get out of that feeling that we're going to get to a place where there's just no COVID in our lives. Right, it's going to exist. It's going to yeah, be like true. the flu. We've said it a million times. Um, but you also just, I mean, with China, you have to just marvel at the sheer power of the state to be able I to know. do something like this. Can you imagine if the federal government sent the army to lock people inside Disney World in Orlando because somebody tested positive. Oh, I know. People Carlo, would lose it. Carlo, I still think back to the early days of the pandemic when what was happening in Wuhan, when you know, when yeah. Wuhan was basically the epicenter, and they shut the whole city down. And Wuhan is not like some small cow town out there. It's bigger than it New is, York City. It is a huge city, completely shut down. People could not leave their houses. And I'm saying that as a New Yorker who lived in the city during the pandemic, it was nowhere close to what it was like in Wuhan. It is yeah. crazy the amount of power that the Chinese government has to shut things like this down. Yeah, I'm not. By the way, I'm not like uh, in, endorsing that. I don't think I would. There, sh there would be riots if they tried to do something like that oh, in the United yes. States, especially and now. Honestly, especially now. Yeah, but there should be. I mean, that is a ridiculous overreach of um, you, you know the government. It's, it's one thing to like for there to be lockdowns 
you know, if there's a serious, you know, wave happening as we saw here, but because one person threw off a, neg uh, a positive test, you know, th that's just not sustainable. No, I agree, Carlo. Let's move on and let's talk about some more news of the Jeff uh, Jeffrey Epstein fallout. He's still causing CEOs to lose their jobs left and right more than two years after his death by suicide. Jess Staley <coughs> suicide. Sorry. Yes, Who yes, that? that's always yes, yes. That's going to be my favorite sort of documentary that's going to be coming out. <laughs> was it a suicide or was this plan? What happened? Anyway, let's talk about Jess Staley. He resigned as chief executive of Barclays. That amid an investigation by British regulators into his ties to the disgraced financier and convicted sex offender. Staley is the latest business leader to get forced out over his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. He had visited Epstein's infamous Caribbean island as recently as 2015, but told the board he cut him off soon after that and the board by the way they believed him he didn't lose his job until regulators started getting involved and by the way that that sort of um that the mindset of saying oh i cut him off after this certain date every ceo from leon black to uh yeah. les wexner all of these people have said that all the time oh i didn't know about this until yeah, i, I cut him off at this particular point so i'm fine over all of this same with uh, two American presidents, Bill oh, Clinton, yes, Clinton and Donald same. Trump. True, true. But both, both of whom were tight with Epstein at least at some point in their lives, and then claimed to basically not know him. But God, Jeff Epstein, man, he sure had a lot of friends for a convicted he pedophile, did. right? He it, did. It's, uh, so, so this guy, Jess Staley, his exit uh, from one of the world's biggest banks, Barclays, follows that of billionaire Leon Black. He left the uh, private equity firm Apollo earlier this year amid a review of his relationship huge, with Jeffrey Epstein. Huge news, by the way. Who, yeah, Black exit followed that, as you mentioned, of Les Wexner, who resigned as CEO of Victoria's Secret parent company L Brands last year after his longtime friendship with Epstein became publicized. So, again, you know, these guys, Jeff Epstein, he sure had a lot of wealthy friends. So you have to just wonder what service was he providing these people or was he just like that good of a dinner conversationalist? Like, was he just that? <laughs> wouldn't that be, they really wouldn't that be more than it all was about? Wouldn't that be so funny if that was the whole yeah. thing? They're like, oh, yeah, he's really, he has an amazing sort of like a steak a pois that we eat at at his house all the time. <laughs> um, and by the way, we didn't even mention another huge fish in all of this, and that's Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew and his ties to this as well yeah. because one of the girls who was alleging that he he sexually assaulted her um, has been trying to give him a subpoena for the longest period of time and and the royal palace refuses to comment on what happened with Prince Andrew yeah. and Jeffrey Epstein another one hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to television. And my goodness, Carlo, I don't know if you're watching American Crime Story Impeachment, but it is so good. The penultimate episode of that show airing tonight on FX, Ryan Murphy's dramatized retelling of the Monica Lewinsky scandal came in with a lot of buzz. But I didn't know if you know this, the ratings have been a disaster. Last week, the episode was tied with MTV's Teen Mom and ESPN's Around the Horn for like 15th of the most watched shows. Yes. <laughs> Frankly, nobody's talking about impeachment. And the reason for that is a cautionary tale for television networks. That's because the deal FX struck with Netflix back in 2016, this series not gonna get a streaming run until a year after it airs on television. That might have made sense maybe five years ago for this sort of deal, but Netflix has since tripled its subscriber base while millions of people have cut the cord. So I should note, if you have a cable subscription, you're able to watch this show right now, but if you're one of the millions of yeah. people out there that cut the cable, you have to wait at least another year to be able to watch this show. Or you could do what I've been doing with which the show with this show, which is the world's worst user experience, where I go to the FX website and I log in with my parents' cable credentials, <laughs> and then I and then I stream it to my TV. Good it's like for it, you. It, it, it takes like ten minutes and it doesn't even work half the time. Um, but it is it is fascinating, right? Because even when this show started in 2016 with the OJ series. Yep. Uh, it, it also wasn't on streaming, but it had a lot more buzz, which just shows you even in that short period of time, you know, the 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 potency of cable television has just plummeted. I mean, look at Squid Game, right? I think this show is actually much better than Squid Game, but the difference in buzz, there's no memes about nope. this show. There's nope. no joke. Nope. No one's joking about it on Twitter. Everyone's still talking about uh, Squid Game. Everyone's dressing up as Squid Game costumes for Halloween like you did. Um, so it's just it's it's a fascinating sort of, you know, case of of what breaks through in this day and age. Right.
Carlo, this, the American Crime franchise is an Emmys darling because the OJ franchise, the first iteration, swept the Emmys across the board. Then the second season, which was the Versace uh, storyline, which I thought was awesome, you had Darren Chris win Best Actor, yeah, was which was so good in that. This one, the cast is absolutely incredible and it's produced yeah. so, so, so well. And if anything, I actually feel like it, it paints every character from President Clinton to Monica Lewinsky to Linda Tripp in negative and positive lights. You actually learn more about each one of the characters yeah. as the story continues to go on. It's incredibly well written, it's incredibly well produced, uh, and, and it's really unfortunate that it's gonna take another year for people to start yeah. to realize this. But either way, I, you know, you're right, it's not driving memes, it's not driving anything right now, and there's literally no buzz. I feel like you and I talking about this right now is the first You're the only person weeks. I know. <laughs> Yes, yeah. you and I talking about this is the first time in weeks I've heard anybody talk about it. I mean, it was in the front page of the New York Times yesterday, and that was sort of the only buzz I've heard about it so far, and which is very unfortunate because I do believe um, I do believe Sarah Paulson's probably going to win an Emmy for Linda Tripp. She's so good in this Incredible. role, yeah. and and I think it's going to be a finalist probably for limited series also. I, I have to say, I, I, Becky and I are watching this in succession, and I'm I'm deeply uh, enjoying both of them. This this show is like it's very kitschy, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of his that's that's it's his campy. shtick, right? Yeah, it's campy, and I like that. And, and um, so with anyway, Ryan I, Murphy, I and with Ryan Murphy shows. It's hit or miss. His Netflix shows, because now when he yeah. has the unlimited sort of budget to do whatever he wants, a lot of those shows, except for Halston, are really big misses. But the FX stuff that he does still sort of have a bite to it, which is really good. Yeah. So, sort of like the early days of the Nip Tuck years. So something about his FX programming is so yeah. much better than what he does on Netflix. I'm really digging Clive Owen as uh, as so Bill good, Clinton, right? by the way. I, you know, I, I, right, we gotta move on. Hold on, on one, last thing, one last thing, one last thing, one last thing. Edie Falco as Hillary Clinton, I'm warming up to it a little bit, but Clive Owen as Bill Clinton, incredible. Yeah. I like her as well. Okay, uh, more to know before we go, Baker. Kick All right, off. so let's start with politics. Joe Manchin, oh, he just threw a Manchin bomb yesterday. He says he cannot support President Biden's social spending bill, putting the brakes on the hopes that Democrats could vote on that bill as early as this week. The senator from West Virginia accusing progressives in his party of holding that legislation hostage, but we should note progressives, uh, even Pramaya Jayapal, saying that the vote still likely will happen this week on those two bills. God, get out of the way, man. Uh, okay, thousands of cops, firefighters, and other city workers here in New York City going on unpaid leave for failing to comply with the city's vaccine mandate. We talked about this a bit on Friday. Uh, it sounds like about 9,000 workers in total are defying the mandate, but 91% of municipal workers are in compliance. So numbers did go up as we expected them to uh, significantly over the weekend just before this deadline came into effect. Quite the interesting new feature that Apple is developing here, Carlo. Apple reportedly testing a new feature that would detect car accidents as they happen. Crash detection for iPhones and Apple Watches would use motion sensors built into those devices that would be able to tell if you're traveling in a car that has been hit, that the feature would then dial 911 automatically on your behalf. Really cool that they've been able to figure that out. I, my understanding is the Google phone actually can do this um, oh, already. Interesting. Uh, I'm not I'm not positive about that. Uh, okay, and uh, this this one I sort of got a kick out of this. Zillow managed to do what no one else could in 2021: lose money flipping houses. The <laughs> online listing giant. Uh, Zillow selling off 7,000 homes, many of them at a loss, after they went hard on this home flipping business called iBuying, just as home price appreciation started to cool. It now looks like it's uh, it may have plateaued a couple months ago. Uh, Zillow looking to sell $2.8 billion worth of its inventory of homes uh, to investors. Uh, Carlo, I don't know if you ever saw that SNL sketch, but it's so true. Zillow, very much my porn, uh, especially over the course of the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, Queen yes. Elizabeth, meanwhile, spotted for the very first time since doctors told her to stay home and rest rather than travel to Glasgow for COP26. The 95-year-old monarch photographed behind the wheel, though, for a leisurely drive around her Windsor Castle estate. She was driving this time, by the way, not her Range Rover. She was uh, driving her personal green Jaguar station wagon, which is also very nice. These pictures of her, she's like peering over oh, the steering them. wheel I in her headscarf. I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm totally as long as she's not on like the like the actual road. No, like she's just the, driving around the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> driving around the estate as one does. Uh, and finally, Baker, Halloween is in the rear view, so you know what that means. Right on schedule, Mariah Carey's "All Ooh. I Want for Christmas Is You" has moved into the iTunes 200. That that song currently charting at number 127 and moving up. So you know. 
It's she, Mariah season, baby. This is Mariah season. Carla, she makes almost a million dollars a year in royalties <laughs> off of that song from November and December. Since that song Brilliant. originally came out, she has made sixty million dollars in royalties. So yes, this is this is Mimi season for the next two months. You gotta hand. It, I mean, that is just respect. What else can you say other than yeah. respect? Amazing. You pump out a Christmas song in 1994, and you're cashing out on it uh, every 25 year. 25 years later, every year. Good for her. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thanks for sticking with us today. That's what you need to know for Tuesday, November 2nd. Go out there and vote if you uh, have something worth voting for.